Okay, um, thanks for coming, especially because it's lunchtime. And I have a lot of content for today, but I hope uh, we can get through it in, in time, okay? So my name is Jesus. I'm here today to talk about time-sensitive networking and uh, how we are enabling kernel interfaces for, for those type of systems, right? I'll start with the cheesy questions, of course. Uh, just need to know a bit more about you guys. How many of you are familiar with time-sensitive networking? Wow, okay. How many of you are working on companies that ship uh, products with time-sensitive networking on it? Okay. And how many of you have used uh, QDisk from the traffic control subsystem on Linux before? Okay. Uh, okay, cool. Well, I'm a software engineer at Intel at the Open Source Technology Center. I've been working on the Linux network stack since mid last year, uh, and I started on this project, so I started with uh, TSN work, basically. Before that, I've done a lot of platform enabling, and I've done a lot of embedded programming as well. And on the old days, I used to be a WebKit commuter uh, and also a committer of the Acute framework. So I have three main objectives for today. I want to provide a very brief introduction to TSN for those of you who are not familiar with it. It's a very extensive topic and a somehow complicated technology, but I think we'll manage. And I then I want to give you an overview about the work we've been doing on the Linux kernel. And then just a brief discussion about what I think the, the challenges ahead are for us. Okay, so let's start with the, with the introduction. So we are all used to these networks that we, we have everywhere nowadays, like local area networks or the internet, right? Uh, everything is best effort, and we care a lot about speed and uh, throughput, and metrics are all based on average. So we have average delay for everything or average bandwidth, right? Those are great networks. I mean, we're using them ever since and everywhere, basically. But they're not very suitable for when you have use cases that require um, high or known availability, right? So for instance, like the circuit switching networks or uh, control networks. And that's why we created a bunch of uh, field buses in the past. Um, but then uh, we created something else recently called time-sensitive networking. So it's a set of standards developed by the IEEE. And what we're trying to do with that is uh, enabling Ethernet-based LANs to provide, to, to be able to handle time-sensitive traffic in addition to best effort traffic, to, to background traffic, to everything that we are used to. So it started as the audio video bridging, AVB. Uh, I want to guess five or six years ago, maybe more, and then it developed and it was renamed to this new set of technologies called TSN. And that's, I think that's one of the main takeaways here is that TSN allows for both uh, time-sensitive traffic and best effort traffic to coexist on the same network, okay? And the whole point of, of TSN is uh, making sure that the time-sensitive traffic is, is deterministic. So we have to provide a bounded worst case latency for it. So that's another takeaway. Uh, the standards that comprise TSN are mostly developed as uh, amendments to .1Q, which is a standard that covers VLANs and QoS uh, from the IEEE. And there is a community uh, behind, I think I can call it a community, yeah, behind TSN, it's the Avenue Alliance. So all the members are the, the companies uh, that are interested in TSN are working together to make sure that the the technology is uh, interoperable, right? Uh, TSN targets different segments, so it, it just makes things a little more complicated because it can be used on different market segments and each market segment has a different set of requirements and uh, the technology has to make everyone happy, right? So it's used on uh, pro-AV, on industrial control, automotive systems and all of that. And I think it's used on consumer products as well or uh, some companies have um, been starting to use that recently. So even though it's been used on uh, lots of segments, I've chose something that I think, I, I, I chose an example today that I think that covers um, different requirements to TSN. So it's one of these next generation cars or today's cars actually, 
uh, in which you have all these uh, fancy infotainment systems, right, with all the multiple screens and speakers, and uh, you need to keep video and audio synchronized. And you may add to, I've heard of cars that now have noise reduction inside it, so you have all these multiple microphones on it, right, and then you're doing all noise canceling. You have to keep everything synchronized. And in addition to that, you have the control uh, network. So you have all the sensors for autonomous driving, and I mean, even for just like parking, and all the actuators and all of that. And now uh, they want to use Ethernet on these systems, and all the traffic can, as I said, can coexist on the same network, right? So it's a very complicated problem. But why TSN? I asked myself that question like nine months ago. Like, why are people just moving away from the field buses? and trying to use a new set of technology. Well, it turns out that Ethernet is super cheap. Ethernet Mac is cheap, cabling is cheap, and it's already everywhere. Uh, and I was told that cabling, I don't know anything about cars, okay? But I was told that cabling is one of the most expensive components uh, when you're building a car, because you have uh, different types of them, and it's, anyway, it's crazy. I've seen a picture that I couldn't show here before, but it, it's crazy. And theoretically, as I said, we can have all this traffic living on the same network, right, and with TSN. I'm saying theoretically because I'm not sure if people are doing that already. I work for Intel, not a car company, so, but I think they are. But how does TSN uh, enable that? Um, so I, I put up this diagram here today that I think that covers a very common scenario in which we have a, a regular network uh, and then we have the, I was calling them legacy before, but it's not legacy, it's just a common end stations with like common network card, or let's say non-TSN capable, right? And then you have the non-TSN capable switches as well, and you have a TSN capable end station here who's connected to the network because everything can just coexist, right? But now here we have the TSN domain on this network. So what does that mean? So the mechanisms behind TSN are actually quite simple as an outline. Uh, first, like on the TSN domain here, what you can notice that all the clocks are synchronized. So we have the same time domain for every single end station and for every single switch. And then I said that like time sensitive traffic and best effort traffic uh, both have to be able to coexist on the same network, so somehow well, I know that one traffic has a higher priority than the other traffic, but so somehow the network has to be able to identify such traffic, right? And for that, so traffic identification, uh, the network uses VLANs for that, right? So that's how the network's gonna know about how to prioritize one traffic over the other. Uh, if I now have different traffic types and I have to prioritize them, then somehow I have to allocate resources as well on the network. So my end station and my switches and, and then the, the also the, 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 the receiver end station, they all have to agree on a path, on, on, on priorities and all, which villains to attend to. And then I have to allocate all the resources along the network. And for less, to make sure that uh, all the traffic, all the time sensitive traffic is um, behaving well, we have to shape traffic, so we use traffic shaping for that. Well, it's a, a bunch of mechanisms, and putting them together is actually quite complicated, so somehow we have to be able to configure the network, right? This is out of the scope for today's talk, but I just want to have it captured here. Um, so the standard that's trying to uh, put together different ways to configure the network for TSN is QCC. Uh, and there are different mechanisms for that. It can be done dynamically or statically, or you can have a, a central network control, or it can be all distributed, right? But I said, uh, so t traffic shapers, they play a key role on TSN networks overall, right? So traffic shaping, so how many of you here are familiar with traffic shaping? Yay, okay. So traffic shape is basically, well, the way I see it is basically, uh, bandwidth management, right? So it's a way for us to distribute traffic evenly in, in, in time, right? put it simply. Um, I said before the TSN applications, depending on the system, you have different requirements. So 
some, for some systems, if all you have for the time-sensitive traffic is uh, reserved bandwidth, that's fine. But for some other systems, uh, we have more uh, higher deterministic requirements. So you need strict cycles because the transmission of packets are going to be scheduled. Uh, TSN has quite a few shapers, and there are new shapers being developed. But I think the main ones and the ones that I'll be talking here today uh, are the QAV, the credit based shaper, the QBV, the scheduled traffic, and uh, another shaper that we call it the time based scheduling. Okay? So QAV is a per queue um, shaper, and it basically provides you bounded bandwidth. So if all you need is that for a given traffic class, uh, the, uh, the packet rate or the, the actually the, the bandwidth ne never goes beyond a certain threshold, that's what QB, uh, QAV is for, so the credit based shaper. But let's say you need um, more fine grain control over the packets, over the transmission time of the packets. So for that, you use a time based scheduling shaper. So you have a per packet transmission time and then the shaper controls when that packet uh, hits its deadline, then it can go into the network. Let's keep this question for later. So when we are using uh, TBS, uh, are we talking about not earlier than or not later than? But I'll, I'll save this question for later, okay? And there is also QBV. Uh, QBV is enhancements for scheduled traffic, and it's a per port schedule. So it's a full schedule of every single uh, transmission queue on the system, right? And yeah. So there are others. Uh, QBU, for instance, is frame preemption. And QCI, that's not even a shaper. It's more about uh, doing filtering on, the, on, on ingress. And there are more complicated shapers coming along. But today, as I said, I'll be focusing on QAV, because this, this was the first shaper developed. It's from the AVB uh, area. And I uh, want to talk a bit about time-based scheduling, OK? Because these are the two shapers that I've been working on on the Linux kernel at the moment. Uh, so I think at this point, you have figured that the, the, the focus here is not on switches, but I'll be talking about end stations, OK? My work is all on end stations. So I've put together this diagram here. Oh, you can see it well, OK. So as I said, uh, an end station on a TSN network it, uh, must be able to uh, handle both time-sensitive traffic and also best effort traffic, so background, background traffic. So imagine on a Linux box, you may have, uh, so everything that is purple on this presentation is a time-sensitive traffic, okay? Uh, so you might have a talker application. That's how we, that's the terminology we use on, on TSN um, tests, at least. So you may have a talker application, and you may have a, an internet streamer application running there as well, like best effort traffic, right? So packets must go through the network stack. I mean, it's Linux. Uh, and they must get to the network card. And it's a requirement for network cards that are TSN capable. That they have at least two transmission queues. So one is used for time-sensitive traffic, and another one is used for best effort traffic. You may have more. The more, the better, actually. And on each one of these queues, there will be a uh, transmission algorithm running, right? And the transmission algorithm is actually a shaper. So it may be that here you install the, the, the credit-based shaper. And I mean, this is best effort here, so it's probably a strict priority. Or you may choose to use the time-based scheduling shaper here. And if this network card is compliant with uh, QBV, then you may have a gate schedule running here that allows the, the gates to run at a certain point. So if you look at this picture here, from the perspective of um, talker system, basically what we have is somehow we must be able to enable the multi queues right? Uh, and then I want to be able to configure them, each shaper individually. And then somehow the kernel must be able to classify traffic because now you have time sensitive traffic and then this traffic has to go to the right queue. So we need a mechanism for classifying traffic so we can steer it to the right transmission queue. And of course, we, we have to be able to transmit traffic, right? So this breakout here uh, may sound actually 
super simple because it is, and it's, it, this was the ground, we, when we did this, when we started with this breakout, this was the ground um, work uh, for when we start designing the, the interfaces on the Linux kernel, okay. Uh, any questions here so far? No, okay. So, after this introduction, so I'll now talk about the, the work we've been doing on the Linux kernel, okay. Uh, we didn't start it from anywhere, right? And like we, had, we first had a look at, at uh, previous attempts. So there is a network engineer from Intel, Eric Mann, uh, six years ago, I think, on the Linux Plumbers. He made a very good presentation about TSN. And he wrote a demo for that, and it was called OpenAVB. So he basically forked a driver, the IGB driver for the Intel i210 controller, and then he didn't want to spend a lot of time creating kernel interfaces for configuring the shaper, so he basically just bypassed the entire kernel, and then he exposed all the transmission queues and uh, the registers to the user space through a library. Um, that was a demo, and then it, this actually became a very big project, and it's still used, um, it's, today it's called Open Avenue. I'll, call, I'll talk more about it later, and it's used in quite a few products out there. I was surprised to know that. Uh, and then the first guy who actually tried to enable TSN interfaces on the kernel upstream was an engineer from Cisco, Henrik Alsted. I'm not sure if I'm saying his name correctly. I'm sorry if I'm not. And he did this very media-centric approach. So he was very focused on, uh, on the AVB side of things. And he bundled everything up as a TSN driver. So he exposed the configuration uh, file system interface for, for his driver and an also shim. So you could just stream uh, time sensitive traffic over the network. It was a nice, it was a very nice job. And he did two iterations of his work, but the uh, maintainers didn't like it because it was uh, very uh, bundled up. Let's put it this way, right? And then I, we also found out that there were a few drivers upstream that are exposing the shapers configuration through device tree. So this is all very um, hardware specific. So just some downsides of these uh, previous works. So uh, they, were, they were all working, but they were all hardware dependent or doing kernel bypassing, or they were very uh, too monolithic, right? And I've, 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 so I mentioned traffic shapers a lot, and when uh, we noticed that there, w there was no upstream support for TSN, we said, well, Linux has a traffic control subsystem, right? And the traffic control subsystem already provide interfaces for, uh, for shaping and scheduling and policing and all of that. And the components from the traffic control subsystem on Linux are basically uh, queuing disciplines, so queue disks, and classes and filters. So queue disks are, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, they're basically packet buffers inside the kernel, so they live uh, between the protocol families and the device drivers. Okay, so a buffer, there are kernel buffers for packets. Uh, with QDisk, you can, you can control how or when packets are transmitted, and every interface, every network interface has a QDisk attached to it, at least one, a root QDisk, and they can expose inner classes in which you can install uh, children QDisks, let's put it this way, right? So, and also, in addition to that, QDIS can offload work to hardware. So when we learned about the, the internals of QDIS, we said, well, this is actually a perfect match for what we need with TSN, right? So for, I just said, so TC is the common line interface for the traffic control subsystem. It's part of the IP route suite. Um, and like, just as an example here, like if you just try to list all your QDISCs now and you have a multi-Q interface, then you see a bunch of uh, children queue disks running on it. So, okay. <coughs> Sorry. And remember, um, when I was talking about the end stations, I mentioned that we broke down the problem in four major steps that we needed to take. So we needed, the first step was, we need to enable the multi queue, right? And then, when we were doing some research, we found out that there was already a, a perfect feed for that. There is a QDIS that can be used as a root QDIS called MQ prior. So it's multi q priority. And we decided this, this was part of our solution. So we started using it. And 
basically what MQ-Prio does is it exposes all the hardware transmission queues as, uh, as classes. Uh, so you can install other queue disks on every single class, right? And in addition to that, you can create a mapping between uh, priority to a traffic class to a transmission queue. It has a very complicated command line, in my opinion, but that's what we have, right? So basically here on this example, what I'm doing is I'm creating three traffic classes. Uh, this controller here, so this interface is for, uh, on my machine I'm using an I210 controller, so it has four transmission queues. But I'm creating three traffic classes, and then I'm creating a mapping here. Uh, and basically what I'm doing is priority three is mapped to traffic class zero, that is then mapped to Q0. And then priority two is, it goes to traffic class one, and then Q1, and then the other, everything else is gonna be mapped to Qs uh, one, zero, one. I always get confused by the numbers here. Three and four, okay? And then if you look here and you, and you dump the classes, then you see that uh, it has uh, one class here for one of the queues, another class here for another one, another queue, and then this is the third traffic class, and it's attached to transmission queues, okay? And then on the breakout, the next, the next thing was, um, now that we have exposed the transmission queues, we have to be able to install uh, the traffic shapers that I want to use on every single queue, right? So for the credit-based shaper, there was nothing out there upstream. And so we designed this new QDIS called CBS. Uh, it was merged uh, recently on, I think, December or November. So it's part of the kernel 415 already. And as part of the patch set, we provide a support for the I210 driver. So the CBS QDIS, uh, it provides hardware offload. So you can just offload the work completely to the controller if it has support for it, of course, or you can use a software fallback. So if you are using a controller that doesn't have support for the credit-based shaper, you can still use the QDisk and have credit-based shaping being done inside the kernel. It's a software-based effort, right? Uh, the configuration parameters are all derived directly from the standard, so we didn't invent this. So you need the low credit and the high credit and the sand slope and the idle slope. And what the idle slope is, basically, is the, is the bandwidth that your traffic class requires, right? And then you have a parameter to dial the offload option, basically. So on this example here, I'm installing the, so I'm using, so I, I configure MQ prior to expose the queues, right, with uh, three traffic classes, and I'm now installing the CBS queue disk onto the traffic class one, okay? So I did it, and then if I just dump the classes now, then you can see that uh, um, CBS is here installed. And then the next QDIS we start working on was for the time-based scheduling. Again, there was nothing up there upstream, and we start to work on this last November, I think. Uh, and we start to work on that with together with uh, Richard Cochran. He's the PDP maintainer. And this work is comprised by two uh, different interfaces. So one is the TBS QDisk. TBS stands for time-based scheduling. And another one is the TX time socket option, right? So first talking about the QDisk, again, it provides hardware offload and also a software fallback mechanism. So if you want to use transmission-based um, uh, scheduling, and you don't have network support, uh, network card support for that, you can use the, this QDisk. And it's training well. Uh, we start working on this, as I said, on, I think, end of last November, and it's currently, I just sent out, like, last week, last Friday, I sent out the, the RFC version three, and I think we're almost um, ready for a final patch set here. So the interface is training well. I just got one uh, request for change, and I'll be working on that starting next week. So this QDisk, uh, it can, oh, and again, we're providing support for the I210, uh, Intel I210 controller, right? Uh, this QDisk, what, the way it works is it can hold packets inside its buffer until the transmission time of packets 
minus a configurable uh, delta factor, right? So if you look at the parameters here, on this case, uh, I'm installing the TBS queue disk, now on the traffic class zero, uh, and I'm configuring a delta parameter of 150 microseconds. So if you want, if, if your if first packet that gets there is supposed to be transmitted in two seconds from now, then the queue disk is gonna hold that packet until two seconds minus 150 microseconds. And then it's gonna dequeue the packet into the net device, right? Are there some DMA timing? DMA timing? No. Okay, I'll, I'll explain now, I hope. Um, so because it's time centric, we need a per packet timestamp. Right, so somehow, and that's what you use the other um, interfaces for. So the application must provide a per packet timestamp, right? And then the queue disk must know what is the reference from that timestamp. So that's why we have a clock ID parameter here. So you can configure the queue disk for that traffic class with a, a given clock domain, right? Both clock domains from the packets and the queue disk, they must be the same. Otherwise, we drop the packets inside the queue disk. Okay. Uh, the other thing that this queue disk does, and I think it's really cool, is it sorts packets based on the transmission time. So imagine you have uh, ten applications on the user space, and they're all sending traffic on the same traffic class, and they have different periods, uh, and then the network card, it's going to block packets until, you, so the, the head of the queue is gonna block all the packets behind it, right? So if the packets are in out of order, then you may have a packet in the future, a uh, packet that is supposed to be sent in two seconds from now, blocking a packet that's supposed to be sent in, a, sent in one second from now, if it hits the net device before, right? So for that reason, what I noticed uh, when I was talking to customers is that most people, they just do the sorting of their packets on the user space, and we decided to provide that from the queue disk directly. So the queue disk, optionally, you can dial an option to turn sorting on, and then the queue disk is gonna sort the packets based on their transmission time. Meanwhile, it's holding packets inside its buffer. I'm sorry? Uh, the question is if we can offload sorting. I'm not aware of any network controllers that sort packets, so the answer is no, but only for, because of the lack of support at the moment. So are you asking, so are you, are you saying that the, the, the hardware might do that automatically? Yeah, for sure you can insert uh, a cross boundary between the software uh, and the hardware. Yes. Within hardware queue you actually can transmit out of order. You can't. You could, but uh, so we got a very, so David Miller, the maintainer of the network stack, his opinion on this sorting thing is, and I hope I'm not co quoting him wrongly here, is that uh, once packets got into the net device queue, so once, once they become descriptors, that's it. There is no sorting. So he doesn't want to be uh, dealing with that on the Linux network stack at least. So short answer, if a hardware is capable of performing sorting, then Yes, there is nothing uh, preventing us to just enable offloading to the hardware, but I'm not aware of any hardware doing that at the moment, so we provide, we're providing that from the queue disk, basically. Uh, so the queue disk doesn't work by itself. It needs, a, as I said, it needs a, a per packet timestamp. So for that reason, uh, we are creating other interfaces for the, for the, for the sockets, right? So. As I said, of course, the end station is to transmit traffic, and this is Linux, so we use a socket interface for transmitting packets. That's obvious. And as part of the TBS work, uh, we are adding this new socket option, uh, the TX time um, socket option. So the, the, the socket option, it basically enables the feature, right? And then it, it, it lets the kernel know that for that socket, there. Uh, 
there are valid timestamps on the packets that need to be copied into the socket buffers. In addition to that, so the clock ID that I mentioned, uh, the per packet clock ID is actually a socket option argument, okay? But in addition to that, we are, we are also adding a C message based interface. So you can uh, set the transmission time, but also there is a flag currently called uh, drop if late. And remember that I had that question on the traffic shaper slide. So what is uh, transmission time? Is it no later than or not earlier than, right? And I try to, because TBS is not a, a standard shaper, it's not defined on an I3PoE document, it's basically common sense. Um, no one has made a decision upon that, so, and I've heard from different customers that depending on the system, they might want it to be uh, uh, a strict deadline or not, or a soft deadline. So for that, we, we created this flag. So this flag is gonna tell the QDisk if it should drop a packet that has delayed, uh, meanwhile it was buffered or not. Uh, yes. And then the other thing, like now we are capable of uh, exposing the queues and we can install the traffic shapers Etc. But we still need to find a way to uh, classify traffic, right? So traffic must be able to go from <clears throat> the application to the um, to the right transmission queues. And for that, because we created the mapping with MQPrio, right? Uh, the kernel already has a mechanism for that. So we just we're just using the socket option priority. And what it does, it it flags all packets from a socket option uh, with a priority, and then. Uh, because MQPrio created the mapping for us, then the network stack is just gonna take all the traffic from that socket and steer it to the right transmission queue. So our job's done. Uh, the socket option SO priority, that's our preferred method, but there are other ways for you to do that. You can use IP tables or NetPrio C group as well. And a caveat here is that when you use that, that's the priority that end and up being used on the PCP field of the VLAN tag of the frames, right? So in the end, this also has the ability to uh, tag all traffic for, for every class uh, with, on the field that is used by the network to identify traffic as well. So it does everything for us. Uh, any questions here? So what happens if an application, so the question was, what happens when an application tries to send, let's say, out of order packets, basically? I think I'm getting the problem. Yeah, that is a problem. And so what we try. Well, we so we, what we try to do, so what the QDisk does is besides uh, dropping the packets that uh, got late inside, I mean, depends on, depending on which value set on the flag, right? The other thing it does is it always keeps track of the last timestamp that was dequeued and into the net device. So if a packet in the past, not, right, from the perspective of the queue disk, is now to be dequeued, it's also gonna be dropped. But these are the only mechanisms we have, unfortunately. 
there is some coordination needed on the user space as well. Unfortunately, there is no mechanism for that at the moment. Yeah. So he was asking if uh, there is a, a way to debug which application is trying to starve the others. And the answer is at the moment, no. But we can talk more later um, about these ideas. OK. So from driver slash hunter perspective, uh, all you need is support for multi-Q and uh, perhaps CBQ of both. CBQ? Yes. I mean, in my view, TSN systems, they require support from hardware, always. But from the Linux, I, on Linux, we have to make everyone happy, right? So I can't create an interface that is uh, only allowing people with certain hardware to work. Uh, so that's why we have to provide the software best effort always, as well. Yes, yes, you can, yes, you're right. So uh, just some results here. Uh, you, can, you can always do time-based transmission uh, using software. You can do that. I mean, your application can call, I don't know, clock nano sleep. And if you want to say, let's say you want to transmit, on my test here, I'm transmitting 322 bytes, right? So all headers included and my payload and I'm transmitting packets every one millisecond, right? And then I measured on the, on the receiver side, I captured the packets, and because I always started in a roundup time in the future, in, let's say in two seconds from now, uh, I measured the offset within the period of the arrival of packets, okay? Uh, I didn't create this test. This test was devised by uh, Richard Cochran when he worked on the first version of TBS, and now we are reusing this as our baseline, okay? Uh, so if you use software, like pure software for that, like my machine, I'll, I'm not using a preempt RT, so number sprint probably can get better. And as you can see here, you can, like the minimum uh, offset that I got was 482 nanoseconds, which is pretty good. But the problem is, this is TSN, right? So I don't care about average, I care about the worst case. And in the worst case, is almost a millisecond. So I almost miss an entire deadline when I was trying to do that all by software, right? And this is a rather good machine. It's a Kaby Lake, and uh, running cyclic tests gives me an average of uh, uh, 50 microseconds of maximum latency. So still, it's, that's, that's problematic, I think, for most applications. But then, if you're using TBS, what I have here is, this is TBS running on the software um, fallback, right? Again, I'm sending packets every one millisecond, and you can get very good minimal numbers. It's a better average, standard deviation is better as well, but still, the problem is the maximum, right? And then if you look peak to peak, which is cheater, that's Super bad. And now this is TBS running on hardware, okay, with the hardware offload and performing sorting and everything, so everything on. And this is uh, with a transmission period of one millisecond, and this is with a transmission period of 200 uh, microseconds, which is quite tight. But now here, what you can see is my maximum offset from the expected arrival time was 506 nanoseconds, which is great. Like my jitter is of only 80 nanoseconds. Okay. How do you do hardware offload for TBS? Like, do you somehow decide when to pass uh, the packet to hardware? It's time machine. You need to make sure that you will not get out of time uh, packet later. That you cannot pass. Yeah, that's what the QD, so the Q does, the Q disk does that for you. No, no, so. Yes, so you need to configure, yeah, you need to configure the QDs correctly, basically. For each system, you may need a delta factor that is slightly different, right? Ah, so you put the QDs. Yeah, so in this case, I was using 100, 130 microseconds of delta. So the QDs would hold packets until 100 
something microseconds, and then we use a high resolution timer inside the QDisk, so it's, uh, it's good. I mean, and you can see here, these are um, very good numbers in my opinion. Okay, uh, I, I really need to move forward. I, I still have a few more slides, sorry, but we, we talk. And then I've been talking about kernel interfaces. It's the focus of this talk, but um, uh, let's just talk briefly about the user space as well, right? Um, as I said, remember the demo that I mentioned from Eric Mann called OpenAVB? This became a big project called OpenAvenue, right? And it has a bunch of components that are quite useful if you're developing uh, TSN systems and applications. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of companies and people uh, contributing to this project, but it's a very nice project, so I invite you all to become part of it. Very recently, we have contributed um, one of my colleagues there from Intel, Andre, he contributed a new AVTP library uh, to this project, so please have a look. And we, for the time synchronization, which I haven't talked at all on this talk, we basically have been using uh, Linux PDP. So we use PDP for L to keep the network cards control, uh, uh, clocks synchronized, and then we use PHC to C to synchronize the controller clock to my system clock. So that's how we've been using this, okay, on our architecture. Last and um, smaller section as well, I just want to talk a little bit about what I think is uh, coming um, ahead for us, right? So we talked about QAV and we talked about TBS. These are the most uh, used uh, shapers at the moment, but QBV is a big thing already, and QBU as well, and it's super important that we somehow provide support for these uh, shapers on Linux, right? Uh, before, last year, when we created the CBS QDisk, we actually shared some ideas. We actually implement, implemented a, a prototype of a new QDisk called TA Prio, that stands for Time Aware Priority. Um, it's basically a Time Aware version of MQ Prio, so you can configure a full schedule per, per port, right? But we got a pushback um, last year because there, are, there were no controllers uh, that were QBV compliant back then, uh, network card controllers, I mean. So the maintainers didn't see the point of uh, us trying to come up with that interface at the moment. But I just recently, I, noted, I, I was told that there are a few vendors who are already shipping controllers uh, that are QBV and QBU compliant, so we may need to revisit this soon. There is a caveat here that, a caveat here that uh, TBS, the, the Q, TBS QDisk, in theory, uh, it can be used to, to, to implement the, the schedule on the end stations. The, the problem is the TBS QDisk works per queue, right? So we need an extra piece of software for providing uh, a scheduler that could convert the whole per port uh, transmission schedule into a per queue, actually per stream schedule, so TBS can be used correctly. So there's more work to be done if we want to use TBS for QBV, basically. It requires um, another piece of software. In my opinion, uh, we should try to revisit the uh, TA Prio Q disk, maybe, or if we think that uh, providing the software fallback is going to be a problem for this, then we may need to just create an interface based on if do or IP route somehow. But that's uh, that's that will be needed. So it, this is something that we have to work on on the Linux kernel. Okay. And then I talked a lot about uh, configuration interfaces, right? But then for the data path, as I said, we just use a socket interface. The thing is, uh, the Linux network stack is very good for throughput, right? I mean, it's designed for that, it's designed for data centers, but TSN, especially for the industrial control and the control systems, TSN is gonna require not only bound and latency, but bound and low latency. And I don't think the Linux network stack is uh, quite ready for that at least. It's, it does a very good job, but when everything comes to making systems more deterministic, then... So there are a few projects looking into that already, so ex uh, the Express Data Path, and there is a new socket family coming along that's gonna provide zero copy for socket buffers. So I'm very enthusiastic about this work. I'm not working on this myself, but I wanted to mention them here today. Okay, and then let's just start to wrap up, right? 
Uh, so we talked about TSM here today and how it provides bond latency on Ethernet-based LANs. Right? Um, we are starting to develop software interface for TSN, and these are becoming available upstream, now starting with uh, CBS and TBS Q disks. Uh, there is the, we're gonna need some future work for some other traffic shapers, so namely like QBV and QBU, and I think that providing a, no, a low latency data path is gonna be the biggest challenge that we have ahead on the Linux network stack. Uh, yeah, there is also a lot of uh, user space building blocks just starting to gaining traction, and uh, Open Avenue is where we are centralizing those. So, and I didn't talk at all about Zephyr because this is a Linux talk, but uh, we, we are not, we're already working with the Zephyr team at OTC, uh, the Open Source Technology Center in Intel, and uh, Zephyr will be providing TSN interfaces very soon, okay? So uh, it's happening. Uh, just a call to action here, if you guys work on companies that ship products with uh, TSN controllers and you have upstream drivers, please enable support for CBS and TBS when it gets merged. Uh, if you have use cases, please come along. We're doing this work all in the open on the NetDev mailing list or just talk to me after this talk as well. I'm a platform enabler, I'm not a, a product developer, so the more I hear about your use cases, the more I learn, and the better I can make the, the, the upstream interfaces, okay? I'm not doing this for myself, I'm doing this for people like you, I think so. Uh, yeah, yes, like if you can start testing our code, then please help us with bug fixes and contributing code, okay? On the slides, I've uh, put a few references along the slides, and then just a bunch of more references here as well in the end, and I think uh, that's it. Uh, so questions? One there, okay. I, I didn't hear you at all, sorry. If Zephyr OS can run on a hypervisor, I, I want to say yes, but it's been almost two years since I stopped working on Zephyr, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say, let's talk about this with the Zephyr team after this talk, okay? I'll, I'll introduce you to the right people to answer that, if you don't mind. It does? Perfect, it does. If the network stack on Zephyr is running on a virtualized network, network how is that gonna work? Yeah, that's a problem. That's <laughs> that's uh, that's one of the that's one of the, that's one of the problems we're looking at at Intel now. But I can't uh, talk more about it just yet. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. If there are any, so the question is, uh, is there any firewalls or IP table um, heading overhead to the TSN path? Anything that is on the data path for packets and it's gonna add latency. So the less the better. Anything, anything, any, any, any extra piece of work you do there uh, matters. No, if the question was, does this require a real-time Linux kernel? No, it does not. The tests that I just show here, I'm not running preempt RT whatsoever. Okay. Not sure I got the question, sorry. So once packets got, <coughs> sorry, once packets got to net dev, what? Uh, did you mention that once, once there's no sorting on the packet, 
Yes. So if you No, once the packets get, so usually what drivers do is once, once they get the packets, they just create a descriptor and DMA them to the network card. No more questions? Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much.